All right, kitty. She's like, I'm going to crawl under the monitors for some reason. <laughs> Get the kitty. Chad is contemplating crumbling under boxes. <sighs> oh, where is she? Yeah, she uh, just left that frame. She just left the frame. Well, uh, well <laughs> we seem... I don't want to jinx it, but we seem to be live again. Give it one more try. Uh, testing again. Sorry, folks. Uh, I don't. I don't know what the heck's going on here. To be honest, um, for the first time is a charm if it doesn't collapse again. <laughs> um, well, the way chat moment, you got a, I got you a VIP, so that's your VIP in the oh, channel now. Sweet. Yeah, there you go. Doesn't do much, but there. Yeah, it's an acknowledgement that uh, you've been here for a while. Um, okay. Fingers crossed. We can do this. <laughs> we are again. Uh, we were talking about. Um, EA caving on FIFA. Uh, they're no longer going to give uh, FIFA points, I think. Yeah. So you, so you can still use your your FIFA FIFA points to buy the whatever uh, card packs that they sell for the game, but you are no longer able to buy more to spend on microtransactions. Yeah, uh, I think it's. Um... It's interesting, to say the least. Um, and like I was saying, I th I'm i pretty sure it's because they were going to fail the lawsuit and it was going to set a precedent. Mm -hmm. It's And th they definitely don't want that. Of course, they're still being like, oh, you know, Belgian authorities, it's, we, we don't believe it's like uh, violating the, the Belgian gambling authorities but you know their interpretation of you know the law because i guess belgians have interpretations of their laws yeah it's they have different interpretations of their laws ea who is not a yeah. belgian company and their lawyers who may or may not be probably are international lawyers and necessarily belgian lawyers <laughs> are having a different interpretation of the law than the officials of the government of belgium who is yeah. to regulate gambling I, I always hate that, like, oh, yeah, it's like, oh, those silly Belgians, they don't know what their laws are. Yeah. Do you know the law? No, you don't know the law. You wrote it? Ah, uh, you, you naive fellow, you. Come on now. You can't have that. By the way, uh, for people who want to know a little bit of behind the curtain things, I think it was because uh, Twitch was trying to both stream our fellow streamer Huckleberry, uh, who check it out, was a great artist, by the way, and ourselves. So it was like, but we want to do this, but we want to do that. It's like just, just, just settle down, <laughs> just settle down for a bit. So that's what happened. So yeah, essentially, it's a I call it a minor victory, mayhap, not a great deal yet, but it's a positive sentiment. It's like oh yeah, they don't want to set a precedent. So in a way, it's a positive precedent because it means that you know when it comes to the government telling companies don't screw with us, then we're like, okay, fine, let's not. Or maybe they thought that it was a small enough market that it didn't ma matter. Yeah. Hmm. But it, it, like we said many times before, I think that can really spread. Uh, talking about markets and talking about, uh, okay, let's just switch to this. Uh, we, uh, we also have uh, news from Valve, who is not very happy that... Uh, Metro Exodus was going to be an exclusive on Epic on the Epic Store for a year. Uh, partially, of course, because it was available for pre, as, as Valve calls it, pre-sale, which is sale before the sale. It's like a pre-order. It's just it's an idiotic term, but, but there you go. Um, sale before the sale, pre-order before the order, just ordering the game on Steam, and then they got janked out. According to uh, Valve's missive, they said that they were 
caught off guard. Uh, this was a sudden move by uh, developers of Metro Exodus, and that um, they were uh, uh, Deep, uh, Deep Silver, I think it is, who's supposed to be the, the publisher, sort of like kept quiet. So I don't know who made the decision. I think this is a publishing decision, but Deep Silver is not saying much. So, you know, what kind of sweet deal, what kind of incentives uh, Epic uh, gave Deep Silver to make the switch? Well, well, they did say it's like it's the, you know, the lucrative that they take less of a cut. But I'm, I, there might be something else to it. Probably. My, oh, it's a, it has to be more than that because you still, I mean, it has to be more than that because this is a game that is so well in the U.S. and around the world. Valve is still the biggest platform for games, right? And there's no guarantee that this new platform is going to reach as many people as Valve can. And you already have an install base, especially people who have bought this game in the past, you know, past installments on on Steam, right? And certainly the Steam users are very angry. At least some of them are anyway. Um, you know, and um, it, they're gonna honor the uh, the essentially Steam keys, right? When when the game comes out, but uh, you know, it's 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 looking shady, a little bit shady. Uh, it's one thing I think to have an exclusivity deal from the get go, but I I personally don't like and I hate to side with our corporate overlords in this, but it's kind of shady when you're like, yeah, we're in your service, we're gonna have pre orders. And then it's like, oh, by the way, no, we're changing to somewhere else. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not a good business practice. They, they had their, the, they had the rug pulled from under them, essentially. And I'm sure Valve is saying something because they don't want other companies to do the same thing. Uh, in other news, uh, GameStop, as everybody knows, has been, well, broke for a while. And I, it failed to according to the no GameStop fails to sell itself in order to get out of bankruptcy they were essentially were offering the company to sell you know and uh slide you know get investors to pump money to the company and they couldn't get the right price nobody was offering the right price my guess is that people were or where investors were interested in basically taking pieces of the company but not the whole thing because it was deemed too risky to you know mm-hmm. and it's, it's part of the transition I think also the problem is that GameStop came to dominate the market and became the only thing, the only game in town. Yeah, it kept buying out other small pop and mom and pop uh, gaming stores. And then when it got up against tough, uh, stiff competition from the likes of Amazon and online sales like you know retailers like Valve, it couldn't evolve. It couldn't really do much of anything, right? Um, I mean, it it tried. It tried with like trying to sell physical items, a, a lot, a lot of pop cap figures, and a lot of like, just like these collectibles are kind of crappy. Honestly, mm-hmm. it it tried leaning more on on physical items, but you honestly could probably find these items cheaper elsewhere. And I think the other thing that probably didn't help them is that when they kind of moved away from selling used um, older legacy consoles, mm-hmm. you got they stopped selling all you know cartridges and stuff, and the, those are there's still a market for that. I I haven't seen any of my like local uh, game stops or game shops that sell old consoles you know die out of business if anything like there's there's like a small chain around here that's got like three locations and where i live Mm. so yeah and and the thing is that a lot of this stuff i mean the reputation from because again reputation matters we talked about this a lot you know the sort of oh yes we can give you we'll give you money and, and store credit for the games used games which they made a lot of money from but we're going to give you literally s- cents to the dollar right you spend you know you spend forty dollars fifty dollars sixty dollars in a game we'll give you ten dollars right uh and a lot of people are like f this i just wait for a, a, a sale on steam you know for half price and get get a copy and that's it right it's it's less convenient it's uh I, I think it was uh, Modern, uh, what, was, uh, what was the channel? 
uh, modern gamer, uh, mo- mo- modern vintage gamer, I think it was, who uh, made a video a couple of weeks ago where he ordered like old games, like old mm-hmm. PlayStation One and 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 other games from the from their catalog. And what he got was like some of them were not working, some of them didn't have complete documentation. I mean, they were used games, but still, it was like some of them were buggy, uh, not very good quality, right? So even in the used sales market, you know, especially for collectors, GameStop is not necessarily the best uh, choice. Yeah, and I'm kind of interesting. And like, who are they expecting to buy them? <laughs> I. Well, I mean, you do have your, uh, it's, uh, you do have your, uh, you know, your retro collectors, right? I mean, if you have a huge, uh, I mean, like GameCube games and PlayStation 1 games and PlayStation 2 games. No, no, I mean, I mean, who was, um, who oh. was GameStop trying to sell themselves to, like, in, in terms of, of who, who were they kind of hoping that would buy them? I oh, wonder, or did they yeah. even really care? I don't. I think they just wanted to get out of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, bankruptcy. That's what they wanted to do. So, so it just makes me wonder where they're, where they're going to go from here. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be honest, like I think the, the last time that we actually set foot in a GameStop was, and to actually buy something like we had an intention to buy something was maybe back when like the super nintendo uh classic was released we went there we went to see if if the nearest one had any in stock they didn't they're like well try in like a couple days and then we walked to like target that was right next to them and they had like eight of them in stock there and that was the last time we we went to a game stop for a legitimate reason not not just to point and laugh uh, you know, I think because I live in Puerto Rico, we're sort of a bellwether sometimes of how things are going to go. And GameStop essentially ceased to be here about two years ago. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I remember I, I had a GameStop like right around the corner. Uh, and I used to go there a lot because I used to play when, when I had the 360. That's how I played. In the, I, I played an entire generation of games on 360 as used games, right? Uh, mm-hmm. They didn't last long, you know. Sometimes they were they break down or whatever. But for ten, twenty dollars, right? I could buy three or four games for twenty, for, you know, for sixty dollars, uh, and uh, and that's uh, that's something that uh, you couldn't beat, right? But then when I switched to PC, and there was no, and I think one of the reasons why I switched, I switched to PC was like, well, I don't have a liable store. If I go to uh, Walmart. They don't have much of a selection there. Uh, so why should I do that, right? It's like, eh. Yeah. Not worth it, so. And and I think a lot of retailers are kind of trying to up their game in their video game section. I've seen it the past year or two. They've been trying to improve their their video game section. They, they started... They kind of started doing what GameStop is doing. They start carrying like these novelties for video game and geek culture, like a lot of figurines, a lot of like, um, a lot of imp- like Target carries like imported uh, Japanese like figures. So they they kind of sell them rather expensively, like they're like eighty bucks, but they they carry them, and they're they're also kind of trying to aim towards other. Not just video games, but other geek, uh, geek culture things mm-hmm. like cartoon, or like retro cartoons and stuff. They, they carry Target carries a bunch of like PopCat figures from like different franchises and stuff, not just video games. So I guess it's it's sort of going back in time where video games are getting merged with uh, the toys toy store, basically side mm-hmm. of the store, right? Yes, um, and. Uh, but I, you know, the difference between Target and Target and Walmart versus GameStop is that they have other. You go to Target or Walmart for other things too. It's like, oh, you know, I need toothpaste and I need like some soap, and like, yeah, I might as well pick out a, a new video game here. Check out their video game. Or like I said, you know, the kid tugging at the mom's sleeve and go like, yeah, yeah, daddy, can I want? Can I want this, mom, mom, mama? Can I get my new Switch game? Look, there it is. Like okay, fine, whatever, right? Um, 
I, in fact, I think Walmart this December was selling mini, and we talked about this before, mini arcade arcade yes. uh, cabinets uh, that were not great. They, they were yeah, like, they're not great. They're like, they were like uh, $300 for uh, the one that I took a picture of had like, it was $300. And I think it had like two or three games on it. And both of the, and two of them were like Street Fighter and then like, the, like Street Fighter 2 and then like Street Fighter Super Street Fighter 2 Super Champion Edition. Yeah, well, what you buy is a kit for you to assemble this machine. And then they had a couple of them assemble as well. They had like asteroids and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, you know. Yeah. And first of all, they're small, you know. Yeah, unless and, you're a and kid, so I have like to... an extra 50 bucks, you can you can buy like a little a box stand essentially to prop it up higher. Uh, and then you have to sort of bend over. And then they're not very high quality. They're literally not designed to be played like an actual arcade cabinet. Because I literally went to the first cabinet and I, I juggled the, the, the controller and the knob came off my... Was like, <laughs> Oops. Okay, like this this is something that would never have happened in the original asteroid cabinet. Those things were built to last because they were worth like $10,000 in 1980, 1979, 1980 money, right? Circa 1980. So these were meant to be played for thousands upon thousands of hours. Today for $300, like, oh, I played for five minutes. Hey, uh, never mind. You know, this that I go buy a replacement knob out of Amazon or something. Come on, it's not gonna work. Uh, but yeah, it shows that they're sort of expanding and trying different things. And just games, it just becomes a. I seen like uh, Kmart, for example. Uh, oh, well, Kmart is also going broke, but because of Sears. Yeah. <laughs> but they eliminated at least here their gaming section months ago. They have TV, some TV, some stuff like that, some all you know tape decks that sort of thing. But they don't have any gaming. Uh, because you know it's more expensive to bring the the physical copies, and and now of course, like oh, you want the DLC for this game? It's like okay, yeah, I thought I was gonna get a disc last time I wasn't in, in the, you know when it was still open here, um, in the store, and I was like oh no, you get a card, yeah, that has a code, so you go to your 360 live account and enter the code, it's like well, uh, I could just. Plug in my 360 to the uh, internet, go directly to the store, pay the same price, and not have to enter any code. Because we're from home, my PJs, at 2 in the morning, and nobody gives a buck, right? So, yeah, I think that's not going to work for them. Uh, moving on, uh, Anthem's demo felt more like a beta. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of... Uh... A lot of bugs in terms of connectivity they had server crashes or not not so much server crashes they had a lot of people having difficulty getting onto the servers for their vip mm -hmm. uh, demo and something they that was dubbed the infinite uh load screen where mm -hmm. people would get stuck on a load screen and it would just keep loading and nothing would happen and it would just keep loading and it would require a full shutdown and restart of the game which I'm guessing is basically they got disconnected from the server while they were in the loading screen and the software didn't know what to do itself. Like, well, yep. we're still trying. Basically, this is what it's loading essentially is that you get the loading screen and behind the scenes is the the, uh, the game was trying pinging the servers, pinging the servers, pinging the server, not getting a ping back. And so it kept kept trying and trying. And because other people were connecting anyway, they, and this, by the way, this is, you said it yourself, it's a VIP demo. It wasn't an uh, an open demo for everybody. It was a VIP for reviewers and the like, right? Like when you get a you know a, a VIP, or credit. I think, or probably if you pre-ordered it too. Yeah, which yeah, and not, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people, some people would ca went in and can cancel it. But the impressions of it is like it's uh, it's you in a farmer jumping around, shooting things. Very Destiny like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I haven't heard terrible things about the gameplay, other than everyone's pretty much saying it's okay. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not super great. It's not a must play. It's not terrible. It's just okay. And mm, I think, I think the thing that it really needs is probably going to be the story and the character interactions mm -hmm. and the world is if to prop it up and. I don't think the demo gave you very much of that. 
It yeah. seemed very limited in terms of the world and the story. And according to Young Ye, he uh, put up a video recently saying that there's some peaks at the the microtransactions, and the microtransactions are around. Some of them are high as twenty dollars per microtransaction. Yeah. So and of course, uh, Bioware responds saying, "Oh yeah, that's like an early thing. We're we we're constantly playing with it, trying to figure out you know the the sweet spot. Which I would say, why does your game even need microtransactions if we're paying six dollars for it? But mm-hmm. that's just me." And yeah, they're they're gonna. Anyone can honestly say that. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a really old screen. They're not gonna be that high, but until until it's released and we actually see this marketplace, we yeah. just have their word to go on. It's like, but but why? Why are you doing this? We don't need this. We don't know. No, stop it. Stop it. Yeah, especially if you can't like gain it. If it would take you hours to earn enough of the in-game gold to buy these things, which like is... I, oof, I really don't want any part of it. I'm gonna give the demo a chance. It it goes public for everybody. The demo this weekend. Mm. I'm going to give it a chance and just see if it's something I would enjoy. But I'm gonna guess it's probably not. <laughs> I didn't have any fun with Destiny, and I have Destiny for free. And I played like the intro, which was a very much single player sci-fi shooter. And I was like, okay, this is fine. And the moment I got dropped into the actual game, which took about an hour and a half or something like that, which by the way, I think one of the reasons why I stopped playing was like, it took me too long to get to the actual game. And also had the, it was an intro, so I didn't bother me so much, but also had the person's part of the lamb. I was like, oh, you do the thing. It's like, ah, cutscene. you got knocked out. I'm like, can you not just write a story where I go where you want me to go? <laughs> you know, can can we, video game writers, can you not write a story that is compelling enough that I, I actually want to and go to the place you want me to go? Is that a thing you could try sometime? Because the whole thing, oh, I'm fighting, I'm shooting, I'm doing great, blah, boom, get knocked out by a superior enemy who clearly has all the powers of cutscene. And writing and writing's blessings. I'm like, oh, no, 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 please don't. Uh, but then you get dropped, and it's like, I looked around, it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is a prettier wow with guns. Okay, I'm done. Yeah, and that's it. I just you know, like, I never come back. I never came back. So I may give Anthem to a, a try, maybe uh, mm-hmm. if it's available on PC on Origin. It probably is. Uh, but no it, guarantees. It is, yeah. uh, the demo, uh, just a warning, the demo is like 45 gig. Yeah, I might just check my, for, my for hard PC. drive. Yeah, hard drive might have yeah. space for it. It's like, oh, yeah, well, you do. You, you know that operating system that you have? You might, it's it's optional for Anthem. Yeah. You don't you have to go there. It's just, it's a, it's a thing. Um, I think those are. I think we have no more real news this week. Uh, well, I Resident did. Resident Evil Two, the remake has done very well. People truly like it. Uh, Kingdoms Hearts Three dropped, and again got some pretty good reviews. Although, uh, if you want to take a, a humorous take on it, you might want to check Jim Sterling's video about how Kingdom Hearts <laughs> is how convoluted the story is. Yes. Uh, uh, Ultra 01, he's playing it, and he's been playing a lot of the Kingdom Hearts games, so you want to check out a good Kingdom Hearts uh, stream, because, again, I don't own a PlayStation, so you want to see it here. You might want to check it out over there. Uh, Ultra with it, a zero, zero one. Um, uh, actually, I did find this uh, interesting story from our uh, favorite Artur, uh, David Cage's company, uh, Qu- Quadratic Dreams. Mm-hmm. So... NetEase is investing in uh, Quadratic Dreams. Mm. So old, good old David Cage is getting some Chinese investors to apparently fund a, a brand new I, IP that's going to be an, in, an in-house game engine and perform uh, have performance catcher stuff in it. And it's also going to be a multi-platform release, which I think it's been a while since they've released anything that's multi-platform. Mm. That's interesting. So we're going to see the evolution of video game, game emotions. movie, emotion, not interactive, narrative. 
negative subject where poor people are angels and we have black people who are, you know, used as poor examples of their own oppression in the games. Yeah, okay, fine, sure. So, but this uh, this also brings up a point that we, we've been seeing a lot of this lately. We brought up uh, Destiny. Um, mm -hmm. We also reported that um, Bungie also got like some financing from from netties a couple of months ago for i think for work on a new property as well well i think there's just a there's a one reason is that the chinese game market is especially the pc market is huge uh and i think these companies saying okay they might be seeing that there may be a downslide in in the rest of the world or slowing down we talked about that before and we say okay now it's time to invest to guarantee that we get the technology and the expertise and the games for pc users and even console users xbox has done fairly well because sony playstation is a japanese company and well that history is a bit complicated in china to say the least uh -huh, you know civil war and uh Rape on Anakin, notwithstanding. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, and so that's the thing. And I think they may be just investing and thinking now it's the time to invest heavily. Maybe they're seeing some trend we're not seeing. You know, maybe they, they're, they're predicting a, 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 a continuous growth in the, in, their, in the home market. And they want to make sure that they have that home market serviced. Because we don't, I mean, outside of mobile uh, ports, we're seeing more and more, you know, like, uh, Activation Blizzard switch into the Chinese market with mobile games, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I think the Chinese gamer is the one who's going to be serving, being going to get the new and better games, right? Uh, or they, these companies are saying, you know, that's a good place to put money. Why are they doing that? We might see in a couple of years, but I think that they're expecting a big growth in, in the PC market or continued growth in the PC market in China that might keep them going in South Asia and. South Korea, even Japan, or some other places. So we'll see. I'll have, yeah, to, I'll have to investigate that. But yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, and I guess that that is a good. I guess investment is, it's risky, but it could be a good investment to pay off if you are like a, you know, China being a new a, kind of like a new market. They you, be like a forebearer or mm -hmm. a pathfinder to, to this new market in China that caters to China. Mm -hmm. And although, like I said, there's risks because didn't they, didn't China like kind of temporarily ban video games for a little bit again for a couple months? I mean, there's... yeah, there may be some bans on that, but um, overall, I think uh, um, it's none of these seems ban seems to have stick. So, you know, it's, uh, it seems to be a, a good idea to to keep going. You know, like they're stopping. They're not. They're, they're keep on. They're keeping on playing. So it works for them. So now I think we sort of ran out of news. So we're gonna, in spite of all the technical difficulties, we actually get to talk a little bit about the subject at hand, which is a bit of a free willing stuff that we always do. Uh, but this time we're going to talk about the critic, and we, I think we're going to talk about the practical side of the critic, as in influencing the market and stuff like that. First of all, I'm going to pose the question of whether or not critical bombing or or dunking on a game or anything like that has an actual effect on sales, or for that matter, critical praise of a game has any actual, you know, sales. I mean, have we ever really seen a game that because of the critics has been successful or has failed hmm. i heard some uh, some i've heard some talk about it like a couple of weeks ago maybe a month ago i saw uh, people talking about andromeda a couple of videos like oh andromeda could have done better if the critics hadn't been so harsh on it but yeah and uh, and like you know oh all the negative press and all the negative reviews cost the uh, people to mm -hmm. not pick it up when it first launched and then and it didn't do as good as it should have done or deserved to or EA wanted it. Have your pick. Um, I don't think so. I, not for larger games. I think a lot of those that the developer, the publishers and developers kind of make their bed, make their bed with when it comes to that. I think it, I think where it does 
where critics like Word can either make or break a game is with indie titles because they're going to be the ones that kind of expose uh, smaller titles that usually wouldn't get as much publicity because they don't have the marketing teams as AAA develop, uh, publishers and put it on the forefront and either say, hey, this game's worth buying or don't waste your money. Um, I believe a lot of things, a lot of uh, people on Steam, like the reason why people like Jim Sterling get like death threats and harassment from these, uh, we'll call them what they are, like these asset flippers on Steam is because they do bring naked publicity to, to them and then like don't get people to buy their video games. That so, may otherwise, I guess, not be as wise to what the game is. So the critic basically has a highlight, uh, highlighting obscure games mm -hmm. in a positive or negative life. That's a real impact versus yes. the game that everybody has seen on E3, on every expo, every podcast, every streamer. Those already have the exposure and don't need them. And so people are going to play them regardless. Yes. That's uh, that's a good uh, good way of seeing it. Although although like the with like larger games, their opinions might sway like a small percentage of people that are kind of on the fence and will sit and wait until their set reviewers review the game and give an opinion whether they deserve they feel like it's worth buying at that moment or maybe later down the road or not at all. Yeah. I mean, to me, I think it's more of the real contact is, is again, the old or the old, um, you know, bi confirmation bias. Like most people go to critics, mm -hmm. they go to the YouTube channel, they go to the podcast, even here, uh, even here, yes, <laughs> just to say, oh, yeah, I have this opinion, this idea about this game. Thank God you, A, share it so I'm, I don't feel like I'm alone, and B, you give language to how I feel, right? Like, oh, I love this game, but I don't really know how to properly uh, word it. Oh, here's a critic with a, you know, a thousand word review saying, these are the strong points, this is what they like, and you tap on agree, you can, you know, copy paste and say, this is it. Or, um, no, um, this is, is a bad game or a mediocre game, and here's a review or a podcast or something that backs up what I say. But for the most part, I think most people, when it comes still to the AAA business, still kind of, they may already made up their mind, especially people who pre-order stuff, right? Uh, they don't, mm. you know, if anything, critics are just another target for them to like, oh, you hate my game, you hate me, you hate gamers, blah, 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 blah. So no, no, that's not, not something that uh, people are concerned about. But I do think that it's, um, do critics are really are, weather veins are not on em how people are going to immediately feel about something but rather how people are going to feel about a trend in the industry two three four five years down the line i noticed that with uh, you know i watch a lot of back in the day and still sometimes catch it uh the escapist uh, um yahtzee and it was when he started complaining about something qtes cover based shooters, the fact that, uh, you know, there was a time where everybody used like green and gray and brown filters on their games and the shooters, etc. He started complaining about it and people were like, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, whatever, but it's not really important. And then six months down the line or a year or two, people were like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we get it. We're tired of the cover based shooting and the QTEs and the whatever, right? Um, and I think that's a function of, and we said this before, video game critics and reviewers play far, far more games than, um, than the average person. So they pick up on trends far quicker and they get tired of them even quicker. So if I only play Assassin's Creed and I don't play other open world games, I might notice that other open world games are either aping Assassin's Creed or Assassin's Creed is doing what these other open world games are doing. So it's until I played the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh game, and like, yes, now it's the same, and no, I don't like it, or I'm liking it less. Versus someone who's played Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, GTA, you know, and all those open world games are like, yeah, we've seen all these things before, and 
you know, we're getting tired. Uh, so I think they're very accurate when it comes to sort of larger likes and especially dislikes, what people are going to get tired of. The moment critics start turning getting tired of something, you know, eventually the, everybody else is going to catch up to it to a degree, right? Um, but again, going back to sales, but even then sometimes, I mean, that's sort of like the influencer uh, thing that a couple of years ago picked up. Not always. I mean, we have an example of people. Oh, yeah, someone, you know, the late uh, uh, Total Biscuit was seen as one of the biggest influencers. And sometimes he had an Im impact on the game, but sometimes he didn't. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not a hard and fast rule that just because X, Y or Z plays it. I mean, I guess PewDiePie, but yeah, I was going to say PewDiePie, I, I believe. He's one of the reasons why uh, Freddy, Five Nights at Freddy got popular. Mm -hmm. Was his exposure to, or his, I guess, influence yeah, on playing the game on on, on camera. Yeah, he was playing the, the you know, he, he went along with the whole, you know, being surprised <laughs> and, and, and scare attacks and all that. And so, and his audience was relatively young. And in many ways, Five Five Freddy's was sort of at, at, at the same audience. So it was a perfect synchronicity but then you have when you had influencers at e3 people were like uh yeah maybe we don't that's okay yeah oh yeah when the, when they bring them on stage yeah it's like oh they, hey here's everybody's favorite influencer yeah, yeah day and nine like, and stuff like that it's like i mean day nine does he's one of the biggest you know individuals on 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 twitch right it, you know yeah. who's done very well for him so congratulations i'm not gonna knock it uh but it's like oh he's covering the pc this and that and people are like uh we don't care <laughs> yeah and of course sometimes they're awkward too because it's just because someone can talk on camera to like a large audience over over the internet doesn't mean they can talk on stage. Yeah, or or do live or do live interviews or what have you. Right, it's a it's a different you know it's comfort zones. It can be pretty slim and, or or tiny. Uh, what other areas I think the critic really um, attract? But I also think the critics, and this is a negative example. Uh, again, something that um, they can also. And I think we've done our share of that, you know, whether we wanted to or not. Uh, we can per per uh, keep perpetuate perpetuate. Yeah, that's a word. Myths, myths and legends about video games, right? Mm -hmm. Like the yeah. whole idea of video games are too expensive, or you know, such and such microtransactions are. At least I consider that to be a myth. Uh, there's such things as a fair monetization system outside of free to play games, right? Um, you keep repeating those lines are like well again here's a person who is supposed to know about these things and talks about games and that's their job and well they seem to be knowledgeable ergo whatever they're saying must be you know must be true uh and we made some mistakes here i made them i made them i can't think of any of them on my head but uh, i'm sure people who have watched this one goes like yeah, this one and this one and oh boy, this one was a big one and and, and let, let us not forget that one over there. Oh jeez, yeah. So I'm sure I make plenty of mistakes. Talking about mistakes and critics, and that's the thing is like, I also a comment that I seen a lot is a reaction. It's like, oh, visually reviewers don't never really finish games hmm. or don't have quote unquote skills to finish to play the games effectively, right? Um, and I'm thinking, well, should we have specialized critics the way we have like specialized sportscasters? I mean, some publications do have people on beats, right? You know, but yeah. still it's, you know, not sometimes it's like, okay, we have 20 games came out. Rogers cover 10 and Linda, I want you to cover the next 15 because we just need to have something on the page. Right. Um, get to it, especially in, 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 in big times like uh, in, around November, right? October, November, fall of every year. It's like, oh, the big releases, we need to cover them, make the videos, go get them. It's like, well, I never played an FPS before. I don't like them. Don't care. How valid is that? <laughs> How valid is that criticism, criticism of like, you know, I mean, we talked again this is before, this is very sad, it goes without saying, uh, but is it really valid to have like specialist, you know, uh, critics for things? 
sort of but at the same time you could also argue the complete opposite it's like oh someone who's who enjoys those uh those particular genres of games is going to not maybe not be as always kind of like the game or think more positive of league than than someone who's probably neutral mm-hmm. i don't think that there i don't think there's a neutral state <laughs> yeah one thing i was trying to say i was going the line of, uh, of thought and then i sort of veered away is that and this is both negative in the double sense first of all in the sense that i think from the industry side they think that yeah critics can help sell games and influence people and therefore it's okay to you have to be on their good side and give a good impression to them so they in turn give a good impression to others that is negative in the sense of you know the whole you know incestuous relationship between critics and and publishers and whatnot uh but also i think it's in it again we 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 seen this diminish significantly right to a degree because we mm-hmm. no longer have like oh you are someone who plays with the nes or super nes well your main source of information for all nintendo games is nintendo power right yeah or you know sony all you know uh, magazine for sony, sony all stars or this and that you may have favorite you know angry joe hopefully we are your favorites in some level hopefully uh, your fo- <laughs> favorite uh, uh, Twitch streamer, etc. Your YouTuber, but aside of the extreme cases like PewDiePie, there's not one source of information that's like the source of information. That can, it's like even even when the you know PC gamer is big on the PC space, but people don't necessarily go first to it necessarily. It's just one of many sources. So. As we have more sources of information, more people talking about this, it's harder and harder for the industry to, I guess, use the critic as a as a tool of sales. Right? Yeah, it doesn't it, work as well. Yeah, but of course, you sometimes they could backfire. You, you know, the critic really doesn't enjoy the game. And it's like, oh, you know, we we thought this critic would probably be our talking piece <laughs> and nope he's going to tell you exactly what they, what they think and and we have we, we have a lot of stories of backlashes people getting banned and having bad relationship with with uh or, with studios and i think yeah, if or, it, yeah go ahead yeah or like the the entire shadow of a war thing where it's like oh like you're allowed to play it and stream it but you can't say anything negative and here's some money <laughs> yeah it, it usually backfires in ways that I think it doesn't help anybody. Um, I think t- today, and I guess, again, it's... The critic is also useful, again, as a, a, a weather vane of future trends, especially the negative ones, the ones that people are going to get tired of, the, the, uh, the canary and the coal mine kind of thing. But I also think it's also... The other thing is that and we talked about this before about access and generally in the news media and critics are included in this because they have to have access to games. They also feel like they have to, to a degree, some of them uh, keep the industry secrets, right? Like, Oh, I'm not going to push for this question. I'm not going to question this too much. Um, because if I do, then I don't get access to future games yeah. or I, I, you know, I have a good relationship with so-and-so and, and you know, because I met them in a party or something and I was like, oh, this is a good person. I know people at Bioware. I know people at Epic. I know people at Valve. You know, I, I know some of these folks and they're great folks and why should I say something negative about them through their through the product, which is, you know, you have to make that distance between the product and the person, but there you go, right? We don't, I don't want to say this because there's some good people behind this. Like, yeah, but good people can make crappy stuff. Yeah, so so the question finally is from the point of view of the consumer um, outside of the – how useful is, is – is the critic still useful? Mm, it's to, to a certain extent. Yeah. Mm. I, I think to a certain extent because I think we'd have to like go out there and ask like – just ask people. <laughs> like, we have to do a survey, so, yeah. Do a survey, maybe ask like – kind of maybe people we know that maybe aren't 
we kind of already know don't follow industry trends or gaming news all that much but are gamers and see like hey does do do you look up reviews do you look up critics and see what they say game about a game before you buy it yeah well that's that's all we have time for today uh, again, I'd like to apologize for the earlier uh, problems that we had with uh, Twitch. Seems that they were trying to play two channels at once. I also like to take this moment to apologize for the failure to stream this week. Hopefully, uh, I I did some computing magic, and maybe just maybe it's we're gonna be better for rest of the week. We are. I'm gonna start with plugs for myself, and then uh, finish with Chapman on here. Um, Tomorrow, I believe at 1 o'clock, it's when Ace Combat drops. So it's Ace Combat 7 drops. So as soon as it's available and I can make it work on my computer, I'll be streaming Ace Combat. Um, tonight, uh, I'll be joining the Rectus crew over at Rectus Channel to play more Cyberpunk 2020 uh, tabletop RPG. Also on to- table RP- table- tabletop RPGs, I'm playing on Mondays with uh, over at RPE Glories. Uh, um, Iona is running a a wonderful member of the team. She's uh, running a Dungeons and Dragons um, series. I'm playing Natok, the goblin assassin, also known as the little shit, because he is. Um, and wonderful people. You want to you want to see good like a wholesome like good team of people playing. You should try them out. So you can always find me here on Lessons Learned One and Lessons Learned over a YouTube channel. Tell them where can we find you on the interwebs. Uh, you can find me at Chapamon pretty much everywhere. I am Chapamon underscore Aragon on Twitch and Twitter, and I primarily hang out on YouTube as Chapamon. Well, thank you everybody for coming, and as always, we'll see where we see you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.